Welcome to Jesus Experience. You are designed to receive from God the life of His Son, Jesus Christ. And through the life of Christ in you, you will live and affect the world around you. Now, here is Dr. Gary V. Whetstone. Let's just lift up our hands and thank God for the name that's above every name. That every knee bows, every tongue confesses. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God our Father. Father, we take the name of Jesus this morning that reigns over us. It's our salvation, our deliverance, our healing, our restoration. Father, so we take the name of Jesus over the spirit of infirmity, over all that's assigned against your body. We command by the power of the name that's above every name, you foul spirit of disease and infirmity assigned against the body of Christ. You're rebuked. Loose the organs of the pancreas, the functionality of the heart, the brain, God, every nervous system, the skin. We speak release in the endocrine glands. God, I thank you for the healing virtue in the tongue, in the throat. The cancer dies at the name of Jesus. Father, that virtue flows and restores, and by your Spirit, you quicken our mortal body. We bless the name of Jesus that is our strength, is our might, is our deliverance, heals us, restores us. And God, we give the name that's above every name praise. Just go ahead and give him a clap offering and bless him, for he's worthy of praise and glory and honor. Majesty, we bless you, Lord. Your name reigns in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, go ahead and find somebody and tell them you're already blessed. You're already blessed. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to take a journey. You can be seated. Thank you. In the Word of God, you should have an outline called the Holy Spirit's Ministry Through Us. And... If you don't have one of the outlines, raise your hand. The ushers will get you one. If if Everybody needs one. Those of you online, you can download it. It's called the Holy Spirit's Ministry Through Us. And last week, we talked about the Holy Spirit's ministry in the world. That the world is under intense reproof and correction because they've been found guilty of the sin of unbelief of righteousness because Jesus, the only righteous, is going to the Father, and of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I encourage you, if you didn't hear last week, get the outline anyway and, and, and see what the Holy Spirit is doing. There's over 7 billion people on the earth that are experiencing a reproof of the Holy Spirit in this time of life. Today, we're going to take a journey into the Holy Spirit's ministry through us. What is our part? Then next week we're going to go into the Holy Spirit's manifestations in us, which will be a tremendous enlightenment of how the Holy Spirit's working with you to do the things that he's called you to do. And it'll be an eye-opener for every one of us. So let's pray together and thank God for revelation knowledge. God, we thank you that today we, your body, are anointed by your Spirit. God, we thank you. As we open your word, we experience your power. We experience not just learn, but we experience what you've spoken because your word is alive. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides asunder spirit and soul, goes into the joints and marrow, and traces out every thought and intent of the heart. And there's not a creature that's not able to be identified because everything is naked and exposed unto you to whom we all live to give an account in the name of Jesus. We bless you, Lord. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 brings about a relationship of the Holy Spirit in our life and upon our life. And it says, now the Lord is that Spirit. So if you're talking about who the Lord is, he is that spirit. He's not somebody somewhere else. He is the spirit of the Lord. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Then it says, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass or a mirror the glory of the Lord 
are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, the critical factor here is, A, the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. As soon as we identify the presence of the Spirit of the Lord, we see ourselves. And we see that we are the glory of the Lord. And that we're not human, we're not originated out of our parentage, we are the glory, we are the outshining of the Lord. Not because we have a belief in Jesus, but because his spirit is upon us, he's anointed us, and we are the result of his liberation. So we see ourselves with open face, we behold as in a mirror the glory of God. So I want you to make a declaration with me. These first two scriptures, I want you to say with me, Father, I thank you. Your Lord, Lord, you are that spirit. And where your spirit is, there's a liberator. And because we're liberated, we see ourselves as the glory of God. We don't see ourselves any less. We are the glory of the living God. And we're changed from glory to glory by your Spirit. I thank you, Holy Spirit. I see me as the glory of God in the matchless name of Jesus. Now, you might begin this and think, well, you know, I don't see myself like the glory of God. I I kind of see myself with all of my, my faults and issues and conflicts and situations. But you, all of a sudden, you start saying, I am the glory of God. You, you begin to see yourself as what you've declared because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And as you speak the word of God, that which you are, you experience. Now, you find out that this is not just what you are, but it's also your ministry. It's what you're called to minister out to other people. We'll get into that in a few minutes. It says in verse 1 of chapter 4, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. What ministry? The ministry of freedom. The ministry of making people see themselves as the glory of God. The ministry of seeing people going from glory to glory. Because that's the ministry. As we have received mercy, we faint not. It says, but we've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So here's the call of God of ministry, that there's a commendation, a, a communication of our self to conscience. We're not talking about whether you think I'm right or I'm wrong because that's the knowledge of good and evil. We're talking about the commending to the conscience that reveals the glory of God because the conscience of man is the voice of your spirit and it's designed to reveal God in his glory. So we commend ourselves to the conscience of man. And it says, as it goes on in verse three, but if our gospel is hid, if people can't see it, it's hid in them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of this glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So here's a light shining out, revealing we're the glory of God. You're the glory of God. It's the ministry of the Spirit of the Lord. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So Paul then goes on at the rest of the scripture and talks about all the conflicts and issues that he has. And he says, but they all work for us. 
a far greater transcending weight of glory because everything that's contrary to you brings out of you a greater manifestation of God's glory. You see, the spirit of God's operation in your life is not trying to figure out what to do with you, has already decided you are the glory of God, you are the expression of his life, you are the deliverer of those that are oppressed, and we'll get into this in just a minute. But because in your introduction it says the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon you, you are anointed to see yourself as the glory of the Lord and bring freedom and transformation to the lost, the broken, and the bound. Then they become the ministers of the same anointing. Now, as we take this journey, we need to understand the New Testament church. The first generation church did not have a New Testament. They had an experience with the risen Lord Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, and they had the Old Covenant. So the written scripture in the Old Covenant that reveals the Messiah, that reveals the Holy Spirit, is everything that is amplified in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, in all the epistles, the book of Acts, and obviously in the book of Revelation. So as we look at this going forward, we then can look back to Isaiah 61 and see what the Spirit of God is doing in the earth. I'll tell you, we are in the most exciting times on the face of the earth right now. I'll share with you some of those things in just a moment. But the key factor we, we, need, we need to focus on is this, and that is the Spirit of the Lord God is upon who? Who is he upon? Me. Not me, but you. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Now, I need you to say that to him. Not only are we the glory of the Lord, but I want you to lift up your hands and say with me, Father, I thank you, Father, thank you. that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Your Holy Spirit is on my life. And you've anointed me to minister your glory. You've anointed me to bring your people into your glory because I'm anointed. I am so effective. Nothing can deny your presence and power through me in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we have a message and a ministry because of the anointing. That's our part. Just like Paul said, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. We all with open face beholding as, a mat, as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are changing that same image from glory to glory. Therefore, we having this ministry. Because what you have, you now are called to transform other lives with what you now have received. So here you are, the anointed of God, and you have the proclamation of the gospel to the meek, which is in verse 1 in the middle there. It says, he sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Now, brokenheartedness happens in every level of life. And the cause of the Spirit of God to bind up the brokenhearted does not accuse the one who broke your heart, does not excuse the one who broke your heart, but binds up the brokenness that takes place. You see, when a person spends their time identifying the causes that produce the effect, they never get the healing that God's designed. When they allow the Spirit of God to come in because we're anointed to bind up the brokenness that's in man, then we are supernaturally endowed to bring them to a reformation to what they've never experienced before. It says, he sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. He doesn't say, tell them you're captive. He said, tell them this is a liberation day. This is the day you come free from what has bound you. This is the day. Today is the day. That now is the time you proclaim liberty to the captives. Why? Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. 
liberty. That's what we proclaim. And then it says, the opening of the prison to them that are bound. We don't explain who bound them, how strong the cells were, how large their cell was versus another, but we are anointed to open the prison doors and to set at liberty them that are bound because the gates of hell will not prevail against us. We are anointed to open the prison. Any prison that imprisoned anyone, we are anointed to open that prison. Now, many of us have been imprisoned by multiples of experiences in life. We've been broken by multiples of experiences in life. We've been, we found ourselves captive by circumstances that have limited us by multitude of experiences in life. But here is the Spirit of God, and He is here declaring to the meek the gospel of Jesus. He's here opening the prison doors, proclaiming liberty to the captives, de dealing singularly with the freedom that God has given to those that have been broken, the healing of the brokenness, and to proclaim the acceptable year of our Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Then there's another group of people that are in mourning. And what is mourning? It is the loss of something. It's what we experience when we have loss. You have a loved one that you lose, there's mourning that takes place. There's grief. There's processes of grief. There is mourning from a broken relationship. There's mourning from a child that is rebellious and goes off and does something on their own contrary to the parent's intent. There's mourning when you lose a job. There's mourning when you lose income. There's mourning when you lose a friend. There's mourning when you, you lose a relationship. There's mourning when you lose a house. Mourning happens in any level of life where there is a loss. And that sense of loss, the anointing of God has given unto us an ability to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion or to uh, impute, to induce in their life a supernatural transformation because it's not about how hurt the hurt was. It's about how powerful the healing is. And I find in the scripture as we read it, it says to give them beauty for ashes. I remember a story of a, a family that had lost two children in a fire. Both of their children, their only children, had died. Their house had burned and they had no insurance. And their life was a complete ash heap. And if you think about a natural way to deal with that trauma and that loss and that mourning, it's unreconcilable, unconsolable. You, you can't find words to console someone who's lost their family and everything they own and have no ability to have a recourse or any restoration. It's an ash heap. And here's the Spirit of God, and he gives beauty for ashes. He doesn't explain why did they put the kerosene heater so close to the outlet. They don't explain how did the fire happen. How did the ashes occur? No, the anointing brings beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. So there's not mourning and comfort in the morning. There is oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I have an example in my life where a pastor friend of mine had died. His wife on a Friday. Sunday came. The church was full. Archbishop Hosa was speaking, and he got the wife up, took a wet cloth. She was crying profusely because she had never passed through the church. Her husband had passed through the church their whole life, and now he's gone. He's not buried yet. Her life is in an ash heap. She doesn't know what's going to happen to the church, doesn't know what's going to happen to her family, doesn't know what's going to happen to her. So Benson goes and gets a wet cloth, puts it on her face, wipes it off, and he says, I'm anointed to give you joy. I'm anointed to bring you to a place where you have literally beauty for ashes. Now, take this Bible, get up there and preach. You now are pastoring this church. She stood up, and the joy of God that overwhelmed her, she's still pastoring that church today. It's been about 26 years now. 
And that gospel of that grace, that anointing of God, so transformed her in a moment that it just became an indelible experience in my life because I watched from an ash heap where total decimation has occurred. Now, here is joy. Here is beauty. Here is garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. This is the anointing that's on your life. The spirit of the Lord is upon you, for he's anointed you. And now, because you're anointed, something happens to those that you bring into freedom. You say, but I don't feel like I'm capable. I don't know if I know enough. It's not about knowing enough. It's about the spirit of the Lord is upon you, and you are the vessel through whom God is bringing the miracles. You are the vessel through whom God is bringing the restoration. You are the vessel through whom God is opening the prison doors, setting at liberty them that are bound. He is using you, the vessel, to comfort, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. Give them beauty for ashes, oil of joy for mourning, garner the praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And now they that were bound, they that were bruised, they that were broken, they that were mourning are now given a mission of restitution and restoration that they never would have known had they been not freed. In my own experience, after the torment in my teens and how my life had gone into total destruction, and God opened the prison doors. Somebody ministered to me, got me set free. I found myself with a mission in life to see other people bound, bruised, broken, restored. Not because I felt a special calling for that, but because the Spirit of the Lord of God is upon me. That's what he does. He takes the broken, the bruised, the bound, the tormented, the afflicted, the mourning, and he makes them ministers, and this is what they do. It says in verse 4, number 10 is your bullet point. They shall build the old wastes. They don't explain the waste. They don't avoid the waste. They go into the waste and build. They raise up the former desolations. A former desolation is what has been decimated, completely wiped out that has no semblance of what it originally was intended to perform. And it says, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. I want to stop for a moment and talk about the ministry of the Spirit of God in desolations of generations. If you look at today, we are in the most prolific global experience I've ever experienced in my walk on the earth. I've been through the Vietnam War. We've been through the racial times with Martin Luther King Jr. as he, he marched. We've been through the, the times, you know, just having been born in 1953, you go through life. And during this, I found that what had bound me that I'm freed from, that I now am sent to, some of the things that were desolations of generations, I just want to bring you to some thoughts. One is that in our recent, probably since the 1400s, there was colonialism that took the world going back in time. So since the 1400s, from Spain to France to Belgium to England to Italy, these countries set out to Portugal, and they colonized the world. In that colonization, they subjugated and enslaved the world to serve their colonization of their main court countries in Europe. Most of them were of a royal family that each split up Europe, and they became the controlling dominant. You can go back in history and see that it also controlled Russia. And so all of this relationship of family ended up saying, we own and we run the world. Well, so from the 1400s, colonialism came in and brought a control and enslavement of the world. Then America comes along, and we break off from England, but we bring the same colonialism with us because 
This nation was formed from the same ideals, even though our Constitution was written to stop the tyranny of a king, yet it did not recognize the validity of an individual and the valid nature of every man being equal, even though it says it, but it didn't recognize it. So the nature of desolation continued. You could go back to the Norse when they invaded all the North regions where they plundered back into the 11 and 1200s. You can go beyond that and end up back into Egypt where they enslaved the Jews. Babylon controlled. I mean, you could just keep going back and back until you find that there was never a time that man did not enslave and control man for somebody else's advantage. This has happened since Adam. And because it's been present and it's been operative, now we have, for the first time I've ever seen in my life, a globalization of recognition that this which has been a decimation of generations needs to change. The world is in a cry. America is in a cry. The nations of the world, I'm talking to people all over the world, they are taking statues down from those that came in and colonized them, whether they were Portuguese, whether they were French, French Polynesia. I mean, it doesn't matter where it is. They were under colonization. They were under impoverished slavery. It was the dominant factor. And because of it, the world now is in a move. You've got to understand where we are. We are in a move of God in a dimension that has been unparalleled on a global scale. This is one of the mass revivals that God is bringing to humanity. And guess who is the answer? We are the answer. We are the answer. We are the answer. We are, we, the anointed, the body of Christ, we are the ones to open the prison doors, set at liberty them that are bound. The desolations of generations. We're not talking about what happened in slavery in America alone. We're talking about the entirety of the nature of man to control man and make one man dehumanized and another man superior to another. We have the power to restore the desolation of generations that have brought a full destruction against humanity. So you and I are set on a supernatural course of action because we are anointed. Not because we have an answer, but because he is the answer. And his voice, his spirit is liberty. His spirit restores man to the dignity of righteousness, the honor of being empowered to get wealth to establish his covenant. He's the equalizer of humanity that makes us all sons of God. He tore down the middle wall of partition where there's neither Jew nor Greek, free nor bond, but they are all one in Christ. He did it, and because he did it, and we're the anointed, we're the voice of God that God has ordained for a supernatural time as this. So with that understanding, Wednesday night, everybody say Wednesday night. Wednesday night. We're having a time of sharing Sharing where the desolations have been, sharing where the pain has been, but then identifying what is the Spirit of God doing with us to bring the freedom, to bring the opening, to bring the freedom from the desolation of generations, to bring the waste into fullness of God's grace. And how are we the answer to this global... You know, this is not something that God didn't know before the foundation of the world. He knew this pandemic was going to be here. And what the enemy intended for harm, God is turning for good. He knew you'd be locked up for a couple months. He knew everything would be shut down. On a, I've never seen anything shut down on a global scale. I have never watched this ever in my life. Not that it hasn't happened with plagues before, but this is the first I've ever seen. So, I mean, I've been, I don't want to go through where I've been and what I've seen, but the fact is we've seen a lot of horrific things in our life. But this is one that was very unique because it seized everybody, everywhere, all at one time with a fear of one thing. Now, whether it was as real and as prolific and as destructive as what they said or not is not my concern. But the fact is, it did it, and therefore, now it gave man a moment of pause. 
And they now recognized, wait a minute, things have got to change. Obviously, there are mitigating factors. People took action. Injustices occurred. I mean, you know, just horrendous things. And so they become not just a, a kindle in a, in a fire, but this has been a plan of God, a time of God for the body of Christ and for the world to come to revival. So Wednesday night, we're asking you to come. We're asking you to open your heart, to share, to hear from God as to what you're anointed to see God do because you are. You're the answer. I'm the answer. I know some of the things that I'm doing. I know some of the things I've committed to do, and I'll share them on a Wednesday night. Then it says that after they build the waste places, they're known by God, and they're known by people. Look under 13, which is verse 6. It says, but you shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. This is not talking about a Catholic priesthood or a priest of a particular denomination or, or an ordained minister of the gospel. This is every single person is a gospel minister. Every person is a priest unto God, representing God to man and man to God. It's our ministry of bringing people to glory and glory to glory. And it says, you shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast yourselves. There's a transference of wealth that happens in this move, an immense transference of wealth. So get ready for what God's about to do, because this is not just going to shift the level of dignity, it's going to shift the wealth and monetary value of everyone in that dignity. And then for the shame that happens and confusions in life, because right now, the world's crying out with what do we do? How do we get justice? How do we bring a right standing to this issue that has been destructive in humanity? And this is happening. I've been in, like I said, 136 countries. Only two of them that I've been in were not colonized. That means 134 nations that I've been in, every one of them were under suppression. Every one of them were enslaved. Every one of them were in subjection under a crown somewhere. And then when they got independence, they only knew the same tyranny and their government became a replicate of the very tyranny that was there. Like what happened in Uganda with Idi Amin. I could go on and on and on. Abacha in Nigeria. I could just keep going from country to country that I've been in. And so by understanding that, it is clear that we are in a supernatural time that God has called us to stand in the gap, make up the hedge, and be the voice of God to bring restoration, to bring healing and deliverance. And it says, talking about shame, when we find ourselves in the sense that you were apart, or maybe what somebody else did brought shame upon you, or confusion has overwhelmed you because you just don't know what to do, God said, for your shame, you'll have double, not double shame. For confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Not that somebody rejoices over your confusion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. So for everything that made you ashamed, everything that brought you into confusion, you step into double joy, double blessing, great increase, you step into the priesthood of God, the ministers of God. You step into the anointing that separates and liberates because whatever had shame, blame, and a claim of confusion on you, now you are freed with a sound mind and double joy to be a fulfilled person in whatever it is God puts your hand to. So it's not about visiting again the same wounds and issues and introspection and trying to find inner healing. It's about the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to bring good tidings to the meek. He anointed me to go and bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison doors to them that are bound, to comfort all that mourn, to give to those that mourn in Zion, to appoint unto them the beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. 
And now we, those ministers, and we all are those ministers. We all are that voice. We now find in whatever had brought shame or blame or some sense of confusion in our life, God designed double blessing, double joy, increased grace on your life in dimensions you've never dreamed of. Then God said, I don't want you to figure this out. I'm going to direct the work. Look in verse seven, or number 17. I will direct their work in truth. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. We have the covenant with Jesus. Now the work that we're to do, he directs. Because he's the Lord. And the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's what? Liberty. We all with open face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We see ourselves as the glory of God. And now we are under the direction of his spirit in truth to produce and manifest that freedom. And their seed, verse 9, number 18, shall be known among the Gentiles, their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed which the Lord God has blessed. I mean, all of a sudden, the people that thought you were one thing now says, whoa, you are not what I thought. You are blessed of God. And so you greatly rejoice because you're clothed with God and the earth brings forth righteousness and praise unto God. So let's look at the next scripture. Verse 10. You see, you can see all the New Testament scriptures coming out of this one section of Isaiah 61. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. How many of you are clothed with salvation? The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, your loins girt about with truth, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You are clothed with God. And so because you are, he's covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride ordained herself or, or adorned herself with jewels. So you find yourself in the place of glory. My God, look at the awesome work you did. Look at whose I am. Look at who I am. And look at what you've given me to do with you. You'll direct the work. It'll be known by you. It'll be effective in you. It'll be deliverance to the people. It'll be healing in the people. It'll take the desolations of generations and bring them to an experience of God and as the earth. Verse 11, number 20, brings forth her bud as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth. So the Lord God would cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. This time of the Spirit of God's grace on your life is designed that the world comes to a revival, that they experience righteousness, that they experience praise that raises up. You know, I can remember in the late 80s or mid 80s, when I first went into Nigeria, we couldn't find groups of believers in 50 people. There was only two churches that had over a thousand people in it that I knew of in the country in 1986. And so one of the pastors that I worked with who was under great oppression, the Muslims were killing his people, he was about to flee the region, and we, built, we bought printing companies, shipped them over, printed tens of thousands upon thousands every month of tracts revealing the Quran, showing Jesus in the Quran, what the Bible says about him, that this is not what the Quran does not reveal, but what it does reveal. So it put a quell, it calmed down the murders, and that pastor now pastors a church of over 500,000 people. Every Sunday, 500,000 people gather together on a compound called Canaan Land that he oversees. That same pastor that was crying out, what do I do because my people are being slaughtered, that we helped produce and bring a printing press to just to help them educate the community that was unknowledgeable, we found now has a half a million people and a voice that affects the world. Now you might say, 
I don't see that working in my life. No, it is working in your life. Because where you were bound, where you were hurt, where you were bruised, where you were injured, where you were oppressed, where you were tormented, where you were mourning, God's spirit has come to bring freedom. And you have a ministry to those that are likewise bound. You have a grace to transform their life. You have an anointing that is from God, not from you. It's his spirit. So let's lift up our hands and just receive that anointing to do his work, to operate in his grace, to fulfill his word, to not explain human plight, but be the voice that restores the desolation of generations. Father, I agree together with my brothers, my sisters, that today we are the anointed of God. We are the empowered. Father, we are where the glory of God is revealed. And all that are hurt, all that are wounded, all that are in bondage, Father, we proclaim this is the day of freedom. We heal the brokenness. We speak to the pain. Loose your hold. We command the injury of the brokenness. Be bound. Be restored. And come to your communion and fellowship of right standing with God. Father, we command the prison doors that it become systemic and controlling and dominating. You're bound. You have no power, nor right, nor dominion to hold down whom God has raised up. We speak release of the grace of God to restore and bring wholeness to their lives. Father, I thank you that each one of us are anointed to bring this grace of God, this work of your spirit to the lives around us. God, I thank you that as we assemble together, as we stand together as your body, Father, we are anointed in a dimension we've never dreamed. We are an answer to this world that the world has never known. And we thank you for it, Father, in the matchless name that's above every name, Jesus. I want you to just pray for this time of revival right now, that God brings his voices, your voice, to clarity. God, I thank you for great grace upon our lives. This is a time such as this that we're called to in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank God you're anointed. Why don't you just take a moment and just thank God you are anointed. I mean, just thank God you are anointed. God, we bless you. We bless you. Now, you might think, well, I still have a lot of areas of my life I need healing and freedom in. That's all right. You're being changed from glory to glory because that's what his anointing does. Being in his presence, hearing from his spirit is what brings life after life, freedom after freedom. Amen. And before we close today, we're going to receive our tithes and offerings, our love gifts and our vows and bless the Lord. And I don't want to read the beginning of Malachi I want to read the last part of Malachi 3 because those of you online and those of you here at Victory and in the parking lot, inside and outside and online, we have a responsibility with God to keep our words aright so that we don't speak against God. Listen carefully to verse 13 of Malachi 3. It's talking about don't speak against your giving. And it says, your words have been stout or abrupt in abuse against me, saith the Lord. You say, but what have we spoken so much against you? It says, you said it's vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance? His ordinance was to give, to worship him in tithes and offerings. That we have walked mournfully or humbly before the Lord of hosts. And now we call the proud happy. And they that work wickedness are set up. And they that tempt God are even delivered. Meaning that we're seeing an inequity of benefit in those that use corrupt practices and we honoring you and worshiping you and working with you are not getting the results. And God's saying, you're speaking against me. So you don't speak as you see things. You speak as his word is. And then it gives you the picture of speaking his word one to another and receiving his anointing. It says, then they that feared the Lord, verse 16, 
spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. You know, God listens to your conversation. He's the high priest of your profession. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord, that thought on his name. You see, what you say in secret is heard. So you speak it aright, and God has a book of remembrance. And this is how he acts towards you. It says, they shall be mine, saith the Lord. Verse 17, in that day that I make up my jewels, I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. And then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked and between him that serveth God and him that serves him not. So it's all relational to your worship and it's relational to your voice. So as we worship God, also speak aright in relationship to your giving. Online, there's a button there for donate. If you're using push pay, use your push pay button there. If you're giving cash or using your checkbook or a bank card and using an envelope, what you do is use the envelope. Amen. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you for supernatural grace that God, we are here to bless you. We are here worshiping, honoring, and glorying in your presence. Father, receive from our hands what is worship in yours. And we speak, Father, you are proven that you open the windows of heaven, that you rebuke the devourer, that you cause our fruit never to be cast before its time in the field, that you hear our voice as we honor and worship you in our giving. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Be blessed as you sow. Amen. amen. You can bring your offering up if you'd like to do that. And then I'm going to share Praise something God. very briefly. Um, how many of you believe in sacrificial giving? Amen. You know, sacrificial giving is when you have something and you really aren't sure you want to give it away, but you know that it's time to give it. Well, we are in desperate need of Lysol wipes and Lysol spray or anything equivalent to that, any generic brand, anything like that, so that we can make sure that we wipe every chair down after every person or spray every chair after every service for every person. So if you have any of these at home that you're hoarding, please Not bless. hoarding. They might. They, they <laughs> Some might. people bought a lot and hoarded. So if you have an extra one at your house, please bring it in next Sunday, and we will definitely. Could they bring it in before you Sunday? You can bring it in before Sunday. Okay. Uh, I have to bring it around to one of the other doors where it says Amazon delivery, and they'll take it there, okay? So um, please, today, before you leave, uh, make sure that you do come and get one of these, and um, make sure that you wipe down your seat that we would greatly appreciate it because Victory is the cleanest church in town. And we know that it is, that we are, um, I'm glad to see so many of you back. I know this is our last service, but we've had good attendance this morning. Yeah. And uh, people are coming back to church and feeling comfortable coming back. But it's because Victory goes the extra mile and takes care of making sure of everything uh, with taking temperatures and hand, uh, hand sanitizers station. and everything. Pastor Judy, is that you back there? Can you come on up and share the prayer requests that we talked about with Kaishe? Um, okay, and, and um, this is a really important, um, it's the last service, but you all can do us a favor by passing the word and, and just, we really need uh, Buki, just come up and stand with Pastor Judy as we pray for this. Um, you there, Judy? Oh, she's coming, Okay. She was looking it up. Okay. We have a young lady who is part of the church here who's 14 years old and has been missing since Thursday. Okay. There's a gold alert out for her. And um, her grandmother brings her to church. And we want to make sure that we pray for her today. Pastor Judy, are oh, you going to come all the way up? Okay, great. Okay. Come on up. Buki, why don't you come on up? And we're just going, Buki is our youth director. And. So you can find this on Gold Alert, but it's one of our um, kids here in the church that has been here in the ministry for years. Her grandmother, Tawanda. Dances in the church. You yes. said she's one of the dancers. She's one of the dancers. Um, her grandmother is one of our security here at the ministry. And Cache has been missing since Thursday morning. Um, if you go online, you can go into Gold Alert, put in Cache Rios is her last name. And please pray that 
They find her, that she comes back home. Um, they're trying to get it on the news today. Um, but um, please yeah. just pray. There was a letter that was found that gave them some concerns. So yes. let's just join in agreement for Keshe, okay? Go ahead, Pastor Judy, why don't you pray? Thank you, Jesus. Glory to your name, Father. Father, we come through the blood of Jesus, knowing that you know all things, Lord God. And we commit Cache, your daughter, to you, Lord. Father, we just pray right now in Jesus' name that her whereabouts becomes known. They're able to find her, that you give her a mindset, Lord, if she, if she's able to come home, that she does. If not, Lord, that they're able to locate her and find her. We just come through the blood of Jesus, knowing, Lord, that you know exactly where she is at this time. We pray peace for her family right now, Lord, that her family um, just has the peace of God and that they're able just to cry out to you, knowing that you hear their cry. And we thank you for returning Kashe safely Bando home. Socorre, In Jesus' Bando name Bando we pray. Amen. 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 Yes, thank you, God, Pastor we agree Judy. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Hallelujah. So, Father, we just give you thanks. Let's just give God praise. Father, we thank you that we go out, God, with joy. We are the anointed, even in a situation like this. We are the answer to the pain. And Father, we thank you for the grace of God that's on our lives to bring healing, restoration, and deliverance. And Father, we go out to a world that's in pain. And God, we bring healing. For you said the mountains, the hills break out before us with singing. All the trees of the field clap their hands because your word goes forth and never returns to you void. Father, I thank you. We are the anointed and the blessed. And we cause this world to identify who they are in Christ and all they are in fulfilling your destiny in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, look at your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, live blessed. Amen. We love you. We have wipes here and...